Hi, my name is Gat, but you can also call me Gatsby. And surprisingly to me, the videos where I talk about my silly original character story, Liminal Lost and Found, are some of the most popular videos on my channel. Which, hey, I don't mind. In fact, I'm extremely thankful and even honored I've been given a platform to show you all my, my funny little OCs and that you all seem to actually like them. Hey, what do you think of this? Or at least you'd like listening to me talk about them like a, like a mad person. Honestly, still amazes me. So, uh, continuing on the funny OC video series I have, uh, we have part three of designing, making, whatever you want to call it, uh, cringe OCs. Since this is part three, uh, you probably want to check out the previous two videos in the series if you haven't, because there is a a lot of context and further information about the story and characters for uh, Liminal Lost and Found. Uh, also called LAUGH, by the way, go, if you go off the acronyms. So yeah, if I say LAUGH, this video, I, I probably mean Liminal Lost and Found. But anyways, just like, uh, you know, part two in this series, there's going to be a lot of tying back, talking about characters and established ideas in the previous videos. So if you don't want to feel completely lost and out of the loop, I definitely recommend uh, going back, watching those two videos, coming back here when you're done, if you haven't already. But for those of you who, you know, you don't care, you just want to watch the video, even if you haven't watched the previous two, or you just need a refresher, what is Liminal Lost and Found? So basically, laugh what it is, is imagine characters from across the multiverse. They all get plopped into my take on the back rooms, which I call the liminal. Uh, there's way less monsters and more worrying about like resources and conflicts with the other people stranded in there. There's a small group of these wanderers, uh, which is the term I have for like people who get plopped into the liminal, who have all banded together and have created a settlement called Little Town. And the main four cast of the story, Volpez, Daisy Dawnlight, Levka, and Azure, they all end up becoming a part of a Little Town after they, you know, end up in the liminal. Well, except for Daisy. Daisy was born in liminal, but I don't want to get on it in the tangent. Anyways, they all go out and they scout out uncharted areas of the liminal you know looking for any resources to help out little town or potentially find a way to get back to their home dimensions so for this story i have i have a video where i you know make the main characters i have a video where i make some side secondary characters one thing i don't really have for the story yet is antagonists not every story needs them as plots with hero versus nature or hero versus self narratives can be, you know, just as interesting. But for Liminal Lost and Found, a story that I want to have themes of community and personal growth, I feel like it would benefit by having antagonists who are like on the outside of society. They, they were rejected by society. Just like the Joker, baby. Whatever. I'm not doing that bit. That is a bad bit. <laughs> they re rejected, feel rejected, or they reject community or society for, for whatever reason. Uh, so yeah, in today's video, we'll be doing just that. Designing five villainous OCs. who are all probably cringe in some way or another because I'm, I'm going by what I think would be neat. And it's all... It's all pretty self-indulgent to my tastes, so feel free to roast me in the comments or whatever. But before I get into the art, I want to go ahead and name some unnamed characters from the previous video in the series. For those who don't know, uh, the last one of these cringe OC videos, I had two characters who weren't named. Well, one had a last name but no first name, and the other character was completely unnamed, no name at all. So I asked viewers in the comments, you know, if they had any suggestions, because I, I didn't have any ideas. And I actually got, like, quite a lot, uh, more than I thought I would get, which is just 
once again, just absolutely amazing. I I actually had a hard time picking out names because there was like so many like good ideas and suggestions in the comments, and I I really do appreciate them all. But uh, drum roll da -da 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 for Mayor Murphy, the first one here, the character that had a last name but no first name. I ended up going with. Just a girl wearing sunglasses suggestion of Sandra uh, for Mayor Murphy for her first name because I really like the way Sandra Murphy sounded. I felt like it, I feel like it has a good mouthfeel. I like how it rolls off the tongue. As for uh, Miss Doctor Lady, kind of a cop out because I did a combination of two commenter suggestions, those two commenters being. Evil Worm 9244 and Lightning Jewels 658. Uh, their suggestions being Allegra and Mary Poser, respectively. And I fused them into one name, Mary Poser Algria, or just Dr. Algria. Allegra morphing into its Spanish equivalent, Algria, to better match with the you know, Spanish-based pun lightning jewel suggested. The reasoning for this decision was, well, Algria, the Italian spelling this time, is the name of a song from a rhythm game series that's not, I don't think, super well-known here in the West, called Poppin' Music. And I love Poppin' Music, and Algria is one of my Probably one of my favorite songs from pop and music that I've heard. I don't. I definitely haven't heard all the pop and music songs, but that's definitely one of my favorite ones. And seeing the opportunity to combine a reference to a song I really like, as well as like having a pun kind of go along with it, with the Mary Poser part, it was like I couldn't pass up on. And as well, like the final like bow on top of all of this is that Doctor Algria, her she's like a grouchy moth space alien woman whatever so mary poser algria for those who don't know allegra algria it's a name that means like joy and happiness so by naming her mary poser algria her name basically is like butterfly happy happy butterfly when you know <laughs> in her character she's she's a grouchy moth I might be the only one who finds comedy in this. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's my logic there. Uh, once again, thank you for all of those you know who commented. I, I really do appreciate that. So yeah, with all that out of the way, let me go on to the main, once again, that main delicious meat of the video. Let's make some cringe OCs. Around at the same time I was designing the characters who would appear in the second uh, cringe OCs video, I was designing Moxie. This was around December, so Mickey and Minnie Mouse, as seen in Steamboat Willie, still hadn't made it into public domain yet. But the idea of them being in Liminal Lost and Found was something on my mind. I didn't want to wait for Mickey uh, to enter the public domain, so I started designing my own original character based off of cartoon characters from, you know, the early 1900s, kind of rubber hose-esque animation. And slowly this idea of having this evil little cartoon guy with like evil ink goop powers got in my brain. But then I was like, hey, Wait a minute, that's just Bendy and the Ink Machine. And I don't, I know next to nothing about Bendy and the Ink Machine. So if I, with my limited knowledge, is like, that's just Bendy and the Ink Machine. I was like, nah, I, I need to scrap this idea and come back when I can get some slightly more creative juices flowing. And then time passed and lo and behold, it's January 2024. And Mickey and Minnie Mouse, as seen in Steamboat Willie, you know, Steamboat Willie, that whole cartoon, is now in the public domain. And, you know, once again, I had this idea, well, what if I just take 
Mickey and Minnie and that version of them and just put them in Liminal Lost and Found because of public domain. I can do that. But the more I thought about it, I, I really wanted to design my own characters. <laughs> or at least they're physically, I wanted to design my own characters. And I'll, I'll, I will explain what I mean by that in a bit here. So Moxie morphed from being an evil, edgy cartoon character to part of this mischievous, dynamic duo uh, with their partner, Winnie. With their designs, you know, like I said, not really based off of Mickey and Minnie Mouse. I mean, I guess a little bit maybe, but more so taking inspiration from like other old cartoon characters like I think Buddy is, this, is the, the character's name from like the Warner Bros. And then that, that one human boyfriend Betty Boop have. I, I think his name's like Frankie or something. I, I don't remember. <laughs> that's kind of bad on my part. So visually, that's where their design's from. But personality-wise, this dynamic duo is definitely rooted in how Mickey and Minnie acted in Steamboat Willie. You know, if anyone's actually seen that cartoon, like Mickey Mouse, like for the majority of that cartoon, he is subjecting and torturing countless of these poor little animals to torture as he uses them as like musical instruments. And Minnie is just like, oh, that's so funny. Oh. Of course, she doesn't say that because there's really not a lot of talking audio in that cartoon. I mean, heck, you know what? With Steamboat Willie, that's public domain. I'm stealing that backstory. Moxie was on a steamboat, and that's how they met Winnie, because Winnie wanted to uh, catch a ride on a steamboat to get somewhere, and that's how they, they met. And if Disney arrests me for that, then I'll go to jail, and everyone will be scared of me because I stole from a public domain cartoon, because that's how America works, definitely. I am cringe, but I am free. Unless, like I said, I am arrested stealing from Steamboat Willie. Anyways, in their old tiny, you know, cartoon world, Moxie and Winnie were kind of like a Bonnie and Clyde, except not Bonnie and Clyde, because Moxie and Winnie, they're not murdering people. Uh, they probably don't do really any burglaries. Just a lot of pranks and general disturbing the peace. So when these two ended up in the liminal, they honestly, I don't think it really messed with them too much because all they need is each other, right? So they spend their time in the liminal just mucking about causing all sorts of mischief and trouble for pretty much everyone else they come across just for their like own amusement and just generally doing things that only benefit them at the end of the day. Or at least they try to. I think, uh, like a lot of their plans, they get foiled at the end of the day and they end up like blasting off again, you know, like how Team Rocket does. And I know Daisy Dawnlight, she finds them horrendous because she's, if you remember what I've talked about her before, she's all about order and going by the rules and sticking to the plan. So these two, characters who just go out of their way to like ruin things like that and to cause mischief and mayhem oh she would not like them i like to think that early on in the story when it's just daisy volpez and lefka and you know daisy's like showing them the ropes of, like traversing the liminal they they run into moxie and winnie and you know the guys are like oh who, who are these two and then daisy it's like oh just ignore them they're assholes and I hate them. Well, she wouldn't say that word. I don't think Daisy curses. She tries not to, but she really, really means it. They run into Moxie and Winnie and Daisy is just like, oh, I hate these two. They're the worst. But enough about Moxie and Winnie as a duo. Who are they as individuals? Moxie is definitely the louder one of the two. They can and will insult and tease anyone uh, that they can just to get a rise, to get the reaction. They feed off of that, you know? Uh, the, the type to really try and do the, I'm not touching you, ooh, hovering your hands around or 
make you hit yourself and go, stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself. Very annoying. I hate saying the word, but I guess also gremlin -y energies. So I don't know where else to put this. But I want to also go ahead and say that, yes, Moxie, you've noticed I've been using uh, them they uh, pronouns for Moxie. Moxie is non-binary, uh, specifically agender, only uses they, them pronouns. Good for them. Good for them. Onwards to Winnie. You know, some might look at these two and think that Moxie is the one doing all the mischief. And Winnie's just kind of sitting to the side, kind of, you know, snickering, kind of like egging Moxie on. And then Winnie does do that. But Winnie is the one who comes up with most of the ideas for their mischief. Winnie is the idea maker. Moxie is the one who acts out those ideas. And Winnie often, like when Moxie is trying to insult someone, you know, it's like Moxie's like, you're a, you're a, and, and Moxie gets stuck on what insult to come up with. You know, Winnie will like come up and like whisper in their ear like something. And then Moxie will be like, ah, thanks, babe. Oh, you're a poo poo head. <laughs> a final thing about Winnie is that, uh, yes, uh, they are T for T. Uh, Winnie, Winnie's a trans woman, and I kind of decided that just because why not? Why not? We can, this is my story, these are my characters, I can do anything I want, I can imagine anything with my brain. So there we go. just ever design and come up with a character and you think up some lore uh, for them and you know you think the world of their existence and you marvel at the outcome of this creative endeavor of yours that you have partaken in and then you just forget the character exists you forget about this character you made that's how this next character here was created that being the collector a character i designed all the way back in 2021 after a conversation i had with a friend of mine at least i think that's what led to the collector's creation honestly kind of fitting uh, for the collector that i don't remember where or how it exactly like comes from so who or what is the collector well to quote little character blurb i wrote about them on their art fight profile when i first made and uploaded them there uh, it reads Ahem. the collector is a fully original oc i have they are this eldritch like being that travels across dimensions why to go shopping of course to being like the Collector, the multiverse is just one giant shopping mall. One that they don't even have to spend money at. Paper straws from a 1950s diner? A holographic Mona Lisa? Magical jewels? Whatever catches their eyes, they will take. They will even use their eldritch powers of shape-shifting to get what they desire. Yep. The Collector is basically if Cthulhu had the personality of a self-entitled rich person who thinks everything is just, it's for the taking. Even the looks of other people. Because, um, I'm not sure if you've noticed yet, viewers, but, uh, elements of the Collector's design are eerily similar to Azure's. The Spantex futuristic body space suit the cutout in the chest area, the use of blue and white. And even though, technically speaking, Azure would be the copycat because I made Collector before Azure, I didn't want to, like, I really like the Collector's design and I didn't really want to go back and change it. So instead of doing probably what would be the better thing to do in changing the Collector's design, you know, for this default form of theirs, I just decided that, uh, to turn it into some lore, with the lore being that the, the Collector was taken on some different form and they met Azure and the Collector is like, mm, I love your look. Uh, I think I'm gonna steal <laughs> Bestie. Uh, 
leading to collector's current look. And as you're, you know, upon like finding this out, connecting the dots, does not like it. She is like, I, she hates it. And I feel like they have this, I wouldn't say straight up hatred, maybe like a, see if I can say this word right, I am suck at my L's and R's sometimes. Rivalry between them, I guess. Definitely some animosity. Is that the word? Yeah, there's definitely tension. I don't. I don't think they get along <laughs> that well. And the idea of these two characters having this uh, dynamic between them is really funny to me, uh, considering like the collector, you know, based off Cthulhu, who's like supposed to be like some squid octopus monster. You know, the collector has a lot of cephalopod elements. Their tentacle hair and the little their eye pupils and all the orbs that kind of are over their body their clothes and whatnot are made to resemble cuttlefish eyes if you ever looked up a cuttlefish you know they have like this kind of w looking pupil not exactly but if you kind of simplify it it can look like that and meaning yes all those orbs all over the collector's body are in fact also its eyes do with that information what you will so the collector is, you know, the squid cephalopod entity in Azure having, you know, hydrokinesis water powers is kind of like the ocean connection to the water ocean, if you think about it. So a character who's a squid and a character who likes water, you think they get along, but no, they hate each other. They hate each other so much. I mean, not so much, but they definitely don't like each other. <laughs> and I just thought it was really comical to do that. Also, the Collector being this Eldritch being, I think, basically makes them a god. I think that's how it works. I don't, I don't know. I don't care about Lovecraft. I'm just stealing his shit because I can't because he's old and dead and stupid. But the interactions between them and Prometheus, uh, you know, another character of mine mentioned in the last Cringe OC's video, uh, who is a god. Oh, <laughs> that would be so good. It would be so juicy. I actually really, really want to make a comic on like a potential interaction they could have because I have like, ooh, I have this like really good idea of like what I want to like create and draw. Oh. One final thing about the collector, uh, kind of like mentioning with Moxie, is just quick, you know, hey, these are the collector's pronouns. And in this case, uh, the Collector uses either they, them, or it, its. Uh, for the Collector, uh, unlike Moxie, you know, Moxie is like, hey, I'm non-binary, yada, yada, yada. For the Collector, I think that they, like, they're a being that's above gender, if that makes sense. They just are. Even with that said, I am aware that the Collector does fall into that, like, trope of, like, the non-binary, like, gender queer character being the shapeshifter. And I know some non-binary people don't like that trope, and I know some who do. And for me personally, as a non-binary person, myself, I'm neutral on it. And that's actually why Moxie, I decided to make, you know, them non-binary as well. Because, you know, just like any group of people, you know, we non-binary folks, we're not a monolith. We're not all the same. We all, we're all different. So I wanted to make sure characters who, we had multiple characters who use them, they pronouns, and they were very different, or at least different enough, because, you know, I want to make sure characters kind of ref reflect reality in that way, because, you know, we're all different. We're not, we're not the same. I hope that makes sense. So, with half the video done with Moxie, Winnie, the Collector, sure, they're all antagonists, but they aren't evil. They're mischievous. They could totally end up siding with the protagonists of the story depending on how like things end up going. But the next two characters for this video, these, these guys are actually evil? Evil? Uh, definitely at least more than, than the previous ones.
I have known for a long time now that I wanted an intimidating, scary slasher from a horror movie type character to be an antagonist for Liminal Lost and Found. Just the visual of the cast having to come together and use all their skills, all their wits to overcome this larger than life threat seemed like a really good way uh, for one of the themes I want to have for Laugh, uh, you know, coming together as a community to play out. But there's a problem. I'm a big scaredy baby and I don't watch horror movies. So I don't really have a visual library in my mind for that kind of thing. So I was nervous about making a design that would look, well, scary. I should have said this sooner though, but um, if you don't like horror, maybe, maybe skip this character segment because um, I, I think this guy, this guy here kind of falls into body horror, a candy valley. So just be on the safe side. If that kind of thing makes you squeamish, skip this guy. Maybe the next guy, too, because he does have some facial scarring, but I don't think that is bad. But anyways, just heads up, heads up. I played around with, you know, ideas in my brain for a bit, like maybe going for like a Jeff the Killer creepypasta inspired design. But those creepypasta killer types, they usually have like frailer or like thinner frames. And I wanted this guy to be like more bulky. So I sat down and thought, you know, what am I familiar with? I'm familiar with art. So what's art I find like grungy and scary? And first thought I came to mind was Q Hayashida's art, her body work. Uh, for those who don't know, she is the creator of the manga Doro Hidoro, which I love. One of, one of my favorite things out there. If you didn't know, I really recommend it if you're interested, but only if you're 18 or years or older. No Weenie Hut Jr.'s reading that. There's like boobs and violence. I would feel really bad if like a, a little child read Doro Hidoro because I said I liked it. So no babies, only adults for Doro Hidoro. But yeah, you know, Q uh, Hayashida's, you know, her work, that just kind of gritty feel to it. And then... I always felt like her art always reminded me of artist Francis Bacon. If you ever have seen his stuff, his stuff is like visceral. Like you can, some of his artwork, like you can just feel it screaming. Like it gives you chills, or at least for me it does. It gives me like shivers down the spine. And then that made me think of, well, what's another piece of art that may give me like shivers? Let's say, let's see if I can say this guy's name right because it's French and I'm not the best at French pronunciations. Ode Leon Redon's painting, The Cyclops. And that one's a freaky one. Have you ever seen that one? That one's freaky. Hopefully I'm being smart and putting all like some like artwork examples on the screen. It's creepy stuff, creepy stuff. <laughs> but it's good, it's good, it's a good thing. And then, you know, that Cyclops, that reminded me of, I'm not sure if it's true or not, but I've, I've heard before that, you know, some ancient people, you know, they would come across elephant skulls and then interpret that as that representing a cyclops. So all of these ideas came together for like this cyclops elephant skull slasher guy who I'm naming elephant because skull is like an elephant. It's like his face though. Unlike the other characters for this video, um, I decided I didn't record this, do like a little test run color wise and like brush wise on how I wanted to render him digitally because I wasn't sure exactly how I wanted to do that. And I'm glad I did because it definitely made the whole entire process of drawing him go a lot quicker. As for his background and kind of role in the story, uh, to bring up another artist who is kind of known for making some like gut wrenching pieces, I imagine you know, combining, you know, all the previous in inspirations for Elephant's design, also for the world, the visual look for the world he lives in, but also inspired by Francisco Goya's series of paintings, the black paintings, just another, just a whole bunch of series of these, like, just really dark, scary in a way. 
paintings. If you ever seen, if you if you seen Saturn eating his son, um, that was Goya. He did that, and I saw that painting when I was like six years old because my mom had like a like a art book, an art history book, and that was in there. And then like they get that gave me the heebie-jeebies as a kid. Like oh my gosh, <laughs> but yeah, they're just all the kind of like gritty and settlingness to Goya and all the other artists I mentioned previous's work is what I kind of imagine, you know, elephant's world origin dimension looking like. Where a guy with a scary, where, you know, where a, a scary butcher cyclops man isn't too out of place. It's an environment that is so harsh to live in that in some ways I imagine the liminal is actually a better place to be than, you know, where he's from. And I like to think, even though I don't, like I said, don't know a lot about horror movies and horror movie characters, I am kind of aware of some of the tropes or some of the things that happen. So I think, like, just from my base understanding of horror movies, I think Elephant, like some iconic serial killers in like horror movies, you know, grew up in an environment where violence and cannibalism, whoa was just the thing that they do and, and even normalize. Maybe it was necessary. So when he winds up in the liminal, he's just killing whatever he gets his hand on, not out of, like, maliciousness per se, but that's just the environment he was risen in. That type of behavior is normal. He doesn't see anything wrong with it. Uh, some final things I kind of want to bring up with Elephant is that, um... He's not the sharpest knife on the cutting board, if you know what I mean. You know, his time in his home dimension, he he was definitely a follower, not a leader. I feel like the people he was around with, you know, they were in charge of him and they'd be like, elephant, they point at a guy or something. It's like, elephant, go chop that guy up. We're gonna have him for dinner. And elephant would go chop up that guy and they'd, they'd go have him for dinner. And then the liminal, you know, he has this night Evity, if that makes sense, about his surroundings, you know, he kind of lacks guidance, if that makes sense. So he's very easy to manipulate and trick, take advantage of. And because of that, he ends up being the muscle to the next and final character in, the t in today's video. And, you know, does his bidding, basically acting, you know, like as the muscle to this final character's brain. So, who is this final character? Saturnus Phobos final character here and probably what might be considered the most cringe out of all the OCs in today's video. I guess I'm saving the best for last. But yes, Saturnus Phobos. Who does this guy think he is? He's mixing Latin and, and ancient and like Greek in his name. What's his deal? I mean, he must think he's super important and cool. And he does. He does think that and he he knows that he is. I mean, who's this guy? I mean, what's his his deal? You know what? I'm not I'm sick of speeding around the bush. I'm gonna go ahead and say it. Saturnus is Volpez. Or rather an alternate version of Volpez, who's older. Saturnus is about in his mid forties, early fifties, and evil. Very evil. <laughs> if that wasn't obvious. Uh because uh, unlike our Volpez, who got chunked into the liminal while he was still only morally dubious, Saturnus here became a full-on crime lord in the medieval time period, you know, where, you know, he, they, because there's technically two of them, but they're the same guy. Anyways, you know, in this medieval kind of dimension they're from, became like a crime lord and using all around him as stepping stones to his rise to power. He actually enacted his plan to get revenge on those who feel wronged him. That is Volpez's whole thing in Laugh, early starting out, is that 
he wants to get back to his dimension so he can enact his desired plan for revenge on those who think wronged him in his youth. But surprise, surprise for uh, Saturnus is uh, he was ultimately defeated and ended up in the liminal uh, while running away from all those he wronged uh, because because they wanted to kill him. And now you may be thinking, wow, Volpez, how come you get two people from your dimension? Because, you know, Dr. Algria is also from the same dimension. Just just watch the second video for more context, please. Well, and then again, I mean, Saturnus isn't from his exact, Volpez's exact dimension, because they're like the same guy, but it's like a different timeline. Whatever, the, the point still stands. Why does Volpez get two? And I think that's because out of the main cast of Volpez, Lefka, Azure, and Daisy, I consider Volpez to be the mainest character out of the four. Just because out of all of them, I think he has the most growing to do as a person. And what better foil to becoming a better person than a version of yourself who is just awful. <laughs> And, you know, if, if Volpez doesn't change his ways, he's going to end up like. And Volpez doesn't want to be that guy. He thinks Saturnus is stupid. Uh, one more thing is, you know, like, why doesn't Saturnus also go by Volpez? And I'm not sure if I mentioned this in the first video when I introduced Volpez and his character. Is that Volpez is not Volpez's real name. Both Volpez and Saturnus are aliases that they use, they they want to be cool and mysterious. They don't want to use like their actual name. And it probably when, and no, actually not probably, definitely when Saturnus was younger in his timeline, he did also go by Volpez and changed uh, his alias to something more cooler as he gained more power. And there is some thought uh, for why I went with Saturnus Phobos. First of all, it just sounds edgy, which, kind of this thing he's kind of edgy you know if it wasn't obvious <laughs> but from my outsider baseline understanding of astrology Saturn seems to represent concepts such as growing up responsibility long-term goals but also apparently has ties to karmatic justice and Phobos well that just means fear and phobia. So in Saturnus's mind, this name of his that he's, you know, made for himself is, is a signifier for his whole deal. He's had this long-term goal of revenge. It's something that he sees as an act of justice that needs to be fulfilled. And he wants those uh, who he's coming after to fear him. But this name can also be interpreted as... You know, him fearing responsibility, fearing growing up, because uh, fixating on any point of your life in such a self-destructive and obsessive way that Saturnus does isn't really mature. At least, I don't think it is. Volpez's, his character growth is, you know, without going into too much detail, because I don't want this video to be five hours long, it's already going to be bulky enough as it is, is that things happened to him in his past that were just unfortunate tragedies. And there were people who were responsible for that. But they're dead. They've already, karma or justice, whatever you want to call it, it's already come for them. There's really nothing to be done except come to terms with what happened to him in his past and move on and make a better life for himself. Instead of forever focusing on all that pain, you know, he went through as a, as a teen ager. I think, yeah, I think he was a teenager when all this happened. Yeah. Which, in my mind, makes Volpez uh, more mature than his older self, Saturnus, who won't stop looking back at this point uh, in his life, their life. They're the same guy. I, I don't know. And this kind of plays out in the story like... Like, before Saturnus is introduced, characters in the Liminal who Volpez has never met before till that point would, like, mistake him for Saturnus because they're both foxes, fox 
furry guys. They both wear a mask. And, you know, a lot of these guys was like, Ah! It's, it's him! You're wearing a different outfit, but I know who you are! Ah! Run for the hills! And Volpez is just like, What? I don't even know you guys! What is going on? What? <laughs> Probably not that, but something like that. But those with a keen eye, uh, you know, kind of realizing that, hey, Volpez is right here. A lot of that's missing, but Saturnus, he's got two? But the information that, hey, there's a guy who looks just like you is running around the, the liminal, that doesn't really get across to Volpez. Just people keep mistaking him for someone else, and that like really intrigues him, kind of befuddles him. You know, there's some whispers of some mysterious hooded figure leading this terrifying group of wanderers in the liminal who are leaving behind this trail of carnage and thievery. And finally, after all this build up, this confrontation happens and this hooded figure reveals himself that, Hey, Volpez, I'm you! And Saturnus leading up to this point uh, was spending his time in the uh, liminal gathering power resources trying to figure out a way to go back to his dimension to try again to fulfill his epic revenge plan 2.0 but upon finding out that there's a younger version of himself now in the liminal his plan changes so when this confrontation happens between the two foxes uh, saturnus is like I know how much you want revenge. How about we team up and we go back to your timeline and with your youth and my knowledge, we can get that revenge that we've been wanting, that we deserve. And Volpez, being Volpez, is like, hell no, why would I want to share the spoils of victory with you, let alone take orders, work with someone who couldn't even succeed in his own plans? Because in this point of the story, when this first confrontation happens, uh, Volpez is still very much keen on operation, uh, kind of basically backstab everybody he's met, uh, get a bunch of resources, go back to his dimension and fulfill his plans of revenge. This response, this causes Saturnus to do like a maniacal chuckle. You know, he says something like, <laughs> you really are me, boy. And then his plan changes. Use Volpez to get to his universe, you know, his timeline, of kill Volpez, and then take Volpez's place and get revenge. If that makes sense. <laughs> Another uh, thing uh, that further separates the two is that, once again, mentioned in a previous video, but in that first video, uh, I mentioned that Volpez, he, at the beginning of the story, he kind of ignores it, keeps it hidden, but he does have a background in herbal medicine and old tiny medieval healing while in the liminal he learns more about medical knowledge in general and kind of grows and once again comes into healing and it's like hey this is actually something i really like and, and enjoy saturnus in his timeline instead of furthering his medical knowledge he like branches out into like alchemy so he's out here in the liminal making like smoke bombs and like toxic gas and like other chemical things to get like the one up on his adversaries and it's kind of like in rpgs where like your characters have like potential like branching class options you know Volpez goes one way staturnus went another and obviously you know their dynamic isn't anything new you know stories where a jaded antagonist is just the protagonist from the future trying to convert the protagonist to their jaded ways of being, like I said, isn't new. But I find the concept really interesting and considering, you know, the themes I want to have for Liminal Lost and Found, you know, such as trauma and moving past it in a healthy manner, I thought it would be a cool, you know, idea to incorporate this theme into the, the story. And also just the potential of uh, you know, writing, you know, like, scenarios where Volpez is literally having to outthink himself. Which leads him to doing things and thinking things differently than what he normally would so he can get the element of surprise on Saturnus. Which leads Volpez into broadening his perspective, his viewpoints on things, which further 
drifts him apart from becoming like this terrible older version of himself and like further betters him. I'm trying to cook here. I'm trying to cook. That's part three of the Cringe OCs video done with. Did you have a favorite character out of today's bunch? Any funny little head cannons about this batch of OCs or any of the other characters from the previous videos? Let me know in the comments. I'd love to read it. I will say, though, this will probably be the last Liminal Lost and Found centered video for a while, just so I can give myself some time to actually like start writing and planning stuff out for the story properly instead of just having all the stuff sloshing around in my brain. That being said, this won't be the last OC video from me. Sure, I might be taking a breather from the story of Liminal Lost and Found, but I have a whole bunch of other OCs and other funny little stories that I want to show and tell you all about. Especially with Valentine's Day coming up, I, I will be taking advantage of that and I definitely want to make a video where I show off some of the uh, OCs of mine who I, I like to ship together because I think that is is fun. It can be neat. Thank you uh, for all your support, especially if you've made it this far in the video because um, looking at all the time I spent recording, this is going to be a lot uh, bigger one. This might actually get close to an hour, which is kind of crazy. Um, whoopsie doodle. Like uh, and comment, subscribe if you uh, really like the video. It really does help. If not with the algorithm, it at least gives me a boost in confidence to, to keep at this. And until next time, stay safe, be kind to one another. Bye bye <laughs>